Okay, let's talk about um, ultrasound diagnosis of fractures and acute musculoskeletal. Sorry. So uh, we're going to talk about diaphyseal and intraarticular fractures and what ultrasound um, can uh, add to the examination, clinical and x-ray examination. And here's an example uh, just to get us started of a diaphyseal fracture of the rib. Uh, you can see, sorry, you can see the cortex very clearly here. It's a white line, highly reflective. Ultrasound is reflected by bone. It's got a uh, contains calcium, there's no image beyond it, but when it becomes fractured, as in this case, we can see there's a cortical break here, and then this is really interesting, it's fluid, it's blood in a subperiosteal position. This is the periosteum, and it's the presence of fluid, which ultrasound is excellent at, um, that gives us the diagnosis. Now, traditionally, people thought you couldn't ultrasound bone which is true, there's no image beyond the bone or beyond the bone cortex, but when the bone becomes abnormal, it becomes replaced with fluid or soft tissue, which ultrasound is excellent at. So to give some perspective on how we got here, talking about ultrasound of, of fractures when traditionally it's uh, an X-ray diagnosis, I just thought I'd briefly go through the history of ultrasound. Uh, the gentleman on the left uh, is um, Ian McDonald, and he was uh, an obstetrician and he, Based on sonar uh, in 1950s, they um, started to experiment with sonar and soft tissue and developed ultrasound. And on the right, you can see Tom Brown, uh, who's a physicist, and McVicker was the other uh, doctor who was involved. And the three of them uh, designed an ultrasound machine based on sonar. And um, then we have the evolution of ultrasound, which really is technological. Um, in 1977, after the invention of the microchip, there was real-time ultrasound. The machines uh, became available, and there were large machines on your left here, uh, which were developed, uh, but they're very expensive, £200,000, and really limited to the uh, ultrasound department. We had each hospital have two or three of these, uh, and it was just the limitation of resources and, and skills uh, when I first started in medicine, there was one ultrasound machine in the whole of King's College Hospital, uh, and um, it was very difficult to access the imaging just because of uh, the availability. And then in 2000, um, with increasing computer power, we have increasing technology, and this was Sonosite developed as a portable ultrasound machine on a laptop basis. And since then, they've developed even further to the size of an iPhone here, um, and they're very portable and can be used uh, uh, can be used not, not necessarily in the ultrasound department, but out in the hospital. In fact, the versatility is quite incredible. They can be used in ambulances, in ITU, in A&E, uh, in GP practices, um, if you have this platform. And there was a game changer not about two years ago with the production of this small device here, which is iPhone based, uh, and the transducer is the ultrasound machine. Uh, and it became available at a, a reasonable cost that actually doctors could afford it. These are under £2,000. So the whole, there's been a whole revolution, evolution of ultrasound from large machines to smaller, more portable, and it allows the increase in um, versatility of ultrasound, certainly at the point of care and also in its use. So here's a good question. What percentage of the world's population has access to x-rays? Uh, you think it'd be quite a lot, but actually, according to the World Health Organization, it's only one in four people on the planet. That's 25% of the population. So approximately 6 billion people have no access to x-rays. However, doctors in remote um, areas in Canada and Australia are using ultrasound to make decision triage patients. And this is modern medicine in austere locations. And this is where the portability of these small ultrasound machines can be useful. Uh, the local hospital may be 200 miles away, but using ultrasound, it's able to triage patients and decide who has to go to hospital or not. And so in these remote areas of Canada and Australia, they've been using ultrasound to examine bones and, um, and, and look for fractures. Um, and they can differentiate between soft tissue injury and bone injury. That's a repeat of the image I've already shown you. 
Um, and uh, really the versatility of this mobility of this ultrasound machine that can be used um, anywhere where there's a medical profession or medical professionals or healthcare professionals and the versatility from chest to heart to bones to abdominal examination. The uh, human body is made of soft tissue and ultrasound is excellent at demonstrating soft tissue abnormalities or excellent at demonstrating the anatomy and the pathology. And add this to clinical, it adds another dimension to clinical. Instead of giving a differential with clinical, you add clinical to ultrasound, you can actually make diagnoses. So how versatile is ultrasound in MSK? Well, it's extremely versatile. It can demonstrate muscle tears, tendon tears, ligament, and obviously bone, which we're talking about. And ultrasound, as I've said before, just demonstrates the anatomy and pathology. And in my radiology department, uh, I supervise when I'm uh, working in ultrasound, we have a clinic seeing about 100 patients an hour, um, all seen by healthcare professionals who are all trained in ultrasound, using the versatility of ultrasound from pelvic to vascular to abdominal, chest, neck. It really is, bar the, the, um, the cranium, because it's surrounded by uh, the skull, uh, ultrasound can uh, look at all soft tissue. Now let's talk about, um, so I'm, in part two, I'll talk about muscles, tendons, and ligaments, but I'm really gonna concentrate on fractures and what ultrasound can add. So this is a good question. What type of fracture is not visible on the X-ray? We're taught at medical school that fractures are seen on X-ray. Well, that's not entirely true. There's a percentage, approximately 10 to 15% of fractures you just cannot see on the X-ray and they're all of the same type. Anybody got any ideas? Well, they're non-displaced fractures. Displaced fractures can be seen by anybody. It's where they're, they're malaligned. It's not very difficult to diagnose a fracture when it's displaced, but non-displaced fractures are not visible. And there's some examples here, the hip, scaphoid, ribs, sternum, some facial fractures, the toddler's tibia fracture and the greater tuberosity of the humerus fracture. All of these cannot be seen on X-ray and for the inexperienced doctor, they can provide great difficulty in diagnosis. In fact, in the health service, it's well known that we send patients home with hip fractures. It's not that we mean to, but we just can't see them on the X-ray. In fact, all fractures can be non-displaced and difficult to see on the X-ray. And this is where ultrasound can help. So I'm gonna talk about briefly intra-articular fractures here and non-displaced hip fractures. And what are they? Well, they're impacted fractures of the neck of the femur in a subcapital position. The patient falls on their side. Uh, they've got significant injury. They feel a lot of pain, but then they can stand up, walk, and uh, but their hip is fractured and it's not possible to see on the X-ray. Let's see some examples. So here we have the right hip. Um, the patient has fallen. A 70-year-old patient fall on the right side, admitted with severe right hip pain. There's a pelvic X-ray. Well, Shenton's line is preserved. Just to remind us what Shenton's line is, it's this line here from the inferior neck of the femur coming around to the uh, superior, uh, superior obturator foramen. And this is intact, so there's no loss of alignment. And the um, trabeculae are intact. Uh, this is slightly rota internally rotated, so the neck is full shortened. But a fracture was not diagnosed in this patient. And the lateral, again, there was no fracture seen and the patient was admitted to the ward because she couldn't mobilize. Um, and the doctor came to see me and said, this patient's still not mobilizing three days later. Um, and I said, well, let's repeat the X-ray and here's the X-ray. And she had a fracture of the pelvis, or sorry, a fracture of the hip. It's now become displaced as the physiotherapist tried to mobilize her. This can cause a great deal of um, pain and discomfort. And patients can get sent home. This patient was lucky they were admitted, but if they're sent home, uh, then it's embarrassing when they come back or go somewhere else and have a fracture of the hip diagnosed. And often the patients are not believed either because they've had an X-ray. Oh, there's no fracture on the X-ray. Uh, we won't re-X-ray you and uh, we won't image you further. And it can be of great difficulty in, for the patients trying to convince somebody that there's something wrong with their hip. We now have a very low threshold to CT patients 
um, who have fallen on their side. And here's another case, a 75-year-old lady fallen onto her left side. In retrospect, the left hip is not normal, but it was called normal at the time. We did a CT scan, um, and even then we couldn't see a displaced fracture. The ideal imaging modality is MRI, because um, you get marrow signal changes, you can't miss them. Uh, uh, but that's the availability of MRI, particularly in the acute setting. Uh, but 12 days later, she didn't mobilize and we repeated the x-ray and she had a fracture, but it was there all along. It was just non-displaced and now it became displaced. So let's talk about the ultrasound features of fractures. Uh, just very briefly, obviously, um, you know, delayed hip fracture, one, there's increased morbidity because the patient can't mobilize and they're in a great deal of pain. And also the operation can change from a total hip, from a, a just a simple screw to a total hip replacement. So it does have its connotations. So uh, let's talk about the ultrasound features of fractures. Um, we talked about cortical disruption and we talked about fluid. So let's just talk about the hip fracture, which is an intra-articular fracture. We've got a fracture here on the right, um, which is clearly seen in this case. There's a lucency, there's loss of the trabeculae. There's there is some loss of the Shenton's lines, so the alignment's not there. But I want to draw your attention to here is the fracture, but here is fluid, and it's fluid in the capsule. All bone bleeds, it's highly vascular, so when it breaks, uh, it bleeds. And this is what we pick up on ultrasound. So just, we could do some screening in A&E, patients who fall on their side, normal x-rays, you could do an ultrasound with a high frequency probe on the neck of the femur and look for an effusion. And the presence of an effusion in the presence of trauma is a fracture until proven otherwise, and it would select out patients who require further imaging. Equally, if there's no fluid within the capsule like here on the asymptomatic side, um, then it almost excludes a fracture of the neck of femur or acetabulum. Uh, and here's the evidence. Well, a post-traumatic painful hip uh, sort of series from Israel, uh, 30 patients, ultrasound both hips compared with MRI. It was 100% sensitive and concluded that a negative ultrasound can exclude intra-articular trauma. Is this new? Well, not really. On the plain x-ray, we look for effusions and lipohemarthrosis. There's an anterior fat pad sign on the left of the elbow. That's uh, in the presence of trauma. That's a fracture until proven otherwise. And the lipohemarthrosis on the horizontal beam lateral. Here's the patella. Here's the femur. Here's the fat fluid level. If you saw that, even if the x-ray was normal, you'd suspect a fracture. And really, with ultrasound, we're just demonstrating an anterior fat pad sign of the hip. So that's how we can um, detect uh, fractures of, in the joint in the presence of trauma if there is fluid or blood. Equally, you know, at the side of a pitch, if a player came off and you ultrasounded their knee and you found fluid in the presence of trauma, you could almost certainly say there was a, either a bone injury or a cruciate injury and the patient should be taken to A&E for further management. So ultrasound can be of great help in screening joint, presence of joint trauma or bone injury in the joint. Here again, a possible pathway, uh, ultrasound on this side, no bone injury, there's no fluid within the hip, and then we have fluid on the, on the left, uh, and you'd suspect there's a fracture here in the presence of trauma and refer for further imaging. Um, so conclusion, ultrasound of hip in, in trauma, it has a very short learning curve to be competent. The anatomy is extremely simple. Um, A&E now has ultrasound, which is widely available and perform at the bedside, easy to interpret, and you can compare both sides, and it may prevent people sending home an ultras uh, a fracture um, of the hip in future. Just simple screening. So let's look at some other cases. So this is a patient who had fallen on their right side and had point tenderness over the lower posterior rib. Um, the chest x-ray is normal uh, and the patient in, in the NHS will be told that, you know, it could be bone injury or soft tissue injury um, and give them a card. But patients really want to know the diagnosis. And if you do an ultrasound, you may see one of these, a non-displaced rib fracture, loss of cortex, subperiosteal fluid, 
and blood. And it's important to know, because if you've broken a rib, you can go to your employer and say, I've broken a rib, and he'd probably give you two weeks off. If you say, I might have bruised my ribs, it's or I don't know, it's completely different. And rib fractures in the LD, well, they're, they're not innocent. They can cause uh, loss of function, loss of breathing. You get a pneumonia, and they have a 10% mortality rate. So it's important to diagnose these fractures. Here we have a twisted ankle, and, this, and the, at the top we have what looks like a normal ankle x-ray. We did an ultrasound and it showed this cortical disruption and some fluid. And then it became clear that it was a non-displaced fracture through fibula and tibia. And this just shows you how, more, how much more sensitive ultrasound is than x-ray, particularly for the non-displaced fracture. This is a direct blow to the lower leg. It's the fibula and you can see there's, um, here's the cortex. There's a depression of the cortex, there's fluid here and um, then it continues in a further depression and this is a comminuted fracture of the neck of the fibula. Obviously the uh, perineal nerve uh, may be implicated in, in injury here because it, it winds its way around the neck of the fibula. However that's just another anatomical thing but um, yes you can see the comparison, you can see the uh, displaced comminuted fracture on the ultrasound and also on the x-ray. Uh, sternal fractures can be non-displaced and difficult to diagnose, while well, ultrasound can show you loss of the cortical line here. This is a displaced fracture of the sternum and, you know, correlated with CT. And these can, uh, well, not only very painful, but also can have uh, underlying complications to the great vessels. So, uh, again, ultrasound can be helpful uh, at the point of care. And may you learn the uh, doctor that there's actually a fracture of the sternum. So this patient was unable to walk and they have a fracture of the lower end of the femur um, and you can see the cortical loss here on ultrasound. So here's the cortex on ultrasound, here's the step uh, and they can become shocked with these because the femur, uh, you can bleed into the, into the muscle compartment um, and um, so it's quite important this fracture can be, is picked up. And clearly a patient who comes in who's traumatised and shocked, well it would be a good idea to an ultrasound of the femur straight away and you could demonstrate whether it's a fracture or not and that could be the source of the bleeding. Healing fractures are demonstrated on ultrasound. You can see here callus formation, subperiosteal callus formation. Here's a fracture line here and you can see the callus formation here and the healed fracture here with periosteal thickening. So it can be good for following up uh, fractures. And this is an interesting case. This patient has uh, had a pain on walking. Well, people who walk a lot, they can get stress fractures of the metatarsals. They can be really difficult to diagnose on X-ray. And it's not until you get a periosteal reaction at five days do you pick them up. Uh, but ultrasound can see the periosteum quite clearly. And here's a lifted periosteum with some fluid and some fluid here. And so uh, non-displaced stress fractures can be seen on ultrasound. This is a very simple examination. I've done this several times and found uh, fractures that were uh, on the background of normal x-rays. So stress fractures, very sensitive ultrasound. And of course we can extrapolate this to um, other points of care such as the battlefield, areas of conflict in Syria. This is Dr David Knott who recently came to an organisation to learn about ultrasound. And here's an ultrasound machine in the in the area of, of uh, conflict. But on the battlefield, you could take a portable ultrasound out, a handheld ultrasound. And if the patient's injured, you could look with ultrasound, see if there's any bone injury, particularly of the femur. And if you were skilled, uh, you could uh, look in the chest for fluid and you could look in the abdomen for fluid. And ultrasound is excellent at foreign bodies such as bullets or shrapnel, which is here. So you could use ultrasound to triage patients actually on the battlefield. Um, because of the portability and the handheld ultrasound. And this is a picture of Marie Curie here in the First World War. She was a physicist, a Nobel Prize winner. She unfortunately fell from grace. She had an affair with a married man, but she redeemed herself in World War I when she, um, she invented point-of-care x-rays. And on the Western Front, there were 20 vans with x-rays 
and she, uh, her and her colleagues drove up and down the Western Front x-raying patients who had shrapnel injuries. And it's said that she saved between 700,000 to 900,000 lives because she could demonstrate with x-ray where the shrapnel was above the diaphragm, below the diaphragm, exactly where it was and directed the surgeon and she became celebrated in Paris once more. Um, and um, yes, so she really invented point of care imaging because she took the X-ray machine out to the patient in little mobile vans. Um, quite quite astonishing work. Uh, and I think she got another Nobel Prize for that. Uh, especially when really X-rays were only invented about 15 years earlier. Uh, quite a quite innovative and uh, incredible piece of work. Conclusion: Ultrasound is more sensitive than X-ray for non-displaced fractures. Uh, as you can see at the top, small affordable ultrasound units are more available than X-rays. Uh, ultrasound may be used as a triage for bone fractures and soft tissue in in austere locations. Uh, an ultrasound can definitely differentiate between soft tissue injury and bone injury. Um, just a verbal audit in our hospital, only a third of patients in the fracture clinic have a fracture. Everybody with injury is sent to the fracture clinic uh, and it's a great source of difficulty for the orthopedic surgeons because two thirds of their patients don't actually have a fracture. But if we had ultrasound screening on the front door with trained people, we would almost certainly not miss a fracture and everybody in the fracture clinic would have a fracture and we would be able to differentiate between soft tissue injury and bone injury. It would save a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of distress for the patient. Um, we wouldn't have to immobilize so many patients in plaster. And, um, but things are difficult sometimes to, uh, to introduce. So, um, I've been interested in point of care ultrasound for about 20 years since the advent of these small ultrasound machines. I have a website, ultrasoundsonfrontier.com with uh, a lot of my work, point of care obstetrics, point of care ITU work, point of care, um, point of care, obviously musculoskeletal. Um, and I have a book, Ultrasound Sans Frontier, which is available through Professor Syed. I'm also on the chair of all the committee of BEMUS, which is the British Medical Ultra Society. All my work has been presented there, but it's not really about me. This is about ultrasound. It's about the versatility of ultrasound. It's really about um, just what an incredible tool it is to aid diagnosis. When I was a physician, and I was for many years, um, I had a stethoscope and I was really concerned about going into radiology that I'd be taking a step back from patients. And to a certain extent that is true, but uh, when I saw what I could do with ultrasound, um, I, 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 was, I just couldn't quite believe my eyes that there was this imaging tool, uh, which, you know, instead of feeling the gallbladder, I could actually see the gallbladder. I could see the pathology, I can understand the pathology, I could see why the patient was in pain, and it can be a great benefit for patients. So this is not about me, it's all about ultrasound. Uh, and just on your right or my right, uh, we published a paper in the journal Ultrasound of Ultrasound of Bone Fractures, which is exactly what I've just presented here, but with more information and possibly a few more uh, case histories. Um, and it was published just before this pandemic, uh, February the 4th, 2020. It's the most downloaded paper they've ever had in such a short space of time. So there's great interest about um, using ultrasound for the benefit of patients. Um, and really modern doctors should be using ultrasound in, in their clinics, in primary care. It, it just adds information. Um, and um, here's the book, Ultrasound for Some Frontier, available through Professor Syed. And it really um, goes through an awful lot of how to do these various examinations. So uh, thank you, Professor Syed, for inviting me again. Um, if there are any questions, I'll take them now. And at the bottom of the picture, elephants are made of soft tissue and ultrasound can be of benefit for them. Thank you very much.
thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, Abdul Aziz, uh, you have any question? Uh, if you have any question, you can ask. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you don't have any question with him. So, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So, thank you. And thank you, Professor Galani and your team yet again, uh, allowing me to uh, present one of my favorite topics. Uh, the promotion of ultrasound uh, is such a, an excellent tool. I cannot tell you how useful it is. It's not absolutely everything, but it, it can help so much, uh, giving information, anatomical, pathological, and even a negative ultrasound can be useful. Uh, it can exclude things. And taken in clinical context, clinical is so important. Please don't let me um, detract from the importance of clinical, but as an add-on, it, it really does take um, diagnosis to, um, to, to a good level. So thank you very much.